just uh, I'd like to come back to Galatians. Um, the last time we were in the first part, chapter three, and uh, today I thought I would read the the chapter for you once more, and then we're going to focus today on verses twelve through eighteen. But um, let's look just for context, beginning at Galatians chapter three. Verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law, are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through Him, through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin <coughs> that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, 
shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. But we are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for this text. We pray that your spirit will lead us into the truth. We ask this again through Christ our Lord and for his sake. Clearly, it's a very important text. Um, this this passage, along with uh, sections of chapter four, are very pivotal for what we call like historical redemptive understanding of scripture. Um, the Bible doesn't just come to us as one package, you know, zoomed down from heaven, so to speak. It has occurred through many, many ages, over a period of 1,500 years. Um, it has given us all sorts of truths. Uh, the Bible, of course, began with Moses' writing, and uh, then, you know, through time, other portions were added. The writings of the prophets were added. We have historical documents. We have all of this. And basically, there is a, a, you know, to use what many today are calling narrative theology, there is a, a story to the Bible. Now, the Bible isn't story in the sense that it's fiction, but it's story in the sense that it draws us in to the narrative and it shows us our place. One of the problems that people have when they look at chapter 3 of Galatians is they, they're looking at it from the perspective of their own life rather than from redemptive historical development. So when it says we were, you know, we were under the law for a while, we think of that in terms of ourselves, and then when faith comes, so we're not any longer under the law. That's not the point he's trying to make. He's trying to say that the people of God, you know, there's a transition for them as a whole. This is about redemptive historical movement. And so when it talks about faith having come, He's not talking about the individual who happens to believe on a particular day. He's talking about the coming of Jesus. He's talking about the coming of Christ, you see. And so this becomes a very important truth for us as we're looking at this text. Uh, of course, there is application here. Uh, there's the, the, the promise that was made to Abraham and how even God said that he would justify the Gentiles, the Gentiles, by faith. So the heathen, the Gentiles, the, you know, the nations, those who are outside of the covenant that God made with you know, uh, Moses, they were included in the covenant that was made with Abraham. So what you have is you have you know, this historical connection. You have the people of God identified first with the promise that was given to Abraham but then you have the Mosaic Law that's added. And, you know, it's one of the biggest nettles to, to uncover and understand how we relate to the law of God and what the purpose was for the history of God's people. And even now, as believers, what the application is for us today. These, these chapters in Galatians, are, are particularly pertinent to that. Um, I don't want to get too much into the theology of covenant, but obviously this text alludes to it, so we have to understand some of that to make sense of the text. So our passage today, after 
we read this entire chapter again, we see that the conclusion in verse 11 is that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. And, Paul says, it's proven or it's evident because even in the Old Testament time, the prophet said, the just shall live by faith. Now, again, you know, this, this concept, you know, this goes back to Habakkuk chapter 2 and his book. And this text is picked up, you know, three times in the New Testament. Here, also in Romans chapter 1 and in the book of Hebrews, in chapter 10 of Hebrews. So, what we find here is that Paul uses this as the text that shows that the idea that the law was a means to justification was actually incorrect. Historically, the law wasn't added in order to make a way of justification. But the law in itself is holy and righteous and good. Okay, uh, There's a tendency that um, particularly those in the, in the dispensational school, to sort of lean toward what is called an antinomian position, meaning that the law doesn't seem to have any impact in the life of a believer. And we hear people quoting things like, well, we're under grace, we're not under the law, as if that were to justify our abandoning of the law. And there's a whole movement today uh, even among Reformed people, uh, in, in, in what is known as New Covenant theology, that will tell you that the law doesn't have any application in the life of a believer. And I look at that and I think to myself, that is absolutely ridiculous. To say that the law doesn't have any application in the life of a Christian is to misunderstand, number one, why the law was added in the first place, and the uses of the law the uses of the law. The law doesn't have one function. It has several. The law has to be understood historically. It has to be understood in its fulfillment in Christ. It has to be understood in its abiding moral guidance. There are so many things that the law does. The law, Paul says in this book, was added because of transgressions. Now the point being that you know, the law shows us where we are wrong. Okay? So the law shows us that we all falter. This is part of what Luther discovered when he said, look, the law says do this, and it is never done. The gospel says believe this, and everything is done already. Alright? This was from the Heidelberg Disputation, 1518. He was absolutely right. If you take the law like that and say, okay, the law demands, well, what does it demand? It demands perfection. And you falter even in just one point, then you falter in every point. That's, the, that's what the law does. It condemns us. Okay? It shows us our failings. And Paul said, look, even when I realized that I, you know, I, I mean, obviously he had a Christian experience of reflecting back on it, but he said, he said a couple of things. He said, on the one hand, he felt that he was justified by the keeping of the law. When it came to keeping the law, he said he was blameless. All right, it's Philippians 3. But at the same time, okay, at the same time, he looks at it and says in Romans 7 that the law wouldn't have caught me unless I read that passage where it said, thou shalt not covet. See, it's, it's, it's a law that says don't want what other people have. As soon as you hear that word, you're immediately drawn to what other people have. And the wanting of it is a sin. It's like if I said to you, there's a law that says don't think of a red box. You will just broke that law by thinking of a red box. doesn't matter what the red box looked like in your mind, but you broke that law. So when the law says, don't cover what is your neighbor's, immediately you're breaking that law, even by having it read to you. That's how the law shows up our sinfulness, the exceeding sinfulness of our sin. And that's because we are fallen people. Now, 
What Paul is doing in this text is he's juxtaposing a hypothetical way of redemption through the keeping of the law. And so what he says is, look, if you were to be justified by the law, you would have to keep it all perfectly. And if there was such a case, then you would have justification before God by the keeping of the law. But it's an impossibility. It's a theoretical thing. It's a, it's a hypothetical thing. But it's not what the law was given for. But even this, he says, he goes on and he says, look, the law, this is where we pick up our passage today, the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. All right? Now, just like the just shall live by faith isn't talking about living day to day, but the one who is righteous by faith shall live eternally, will have everlasting life. So the text here about the law says, The man that doeth them shall live in them. It doesn't mean that he that does it lives by the doing of it, but the result is that he has life through doing it. So hypothetically, the law is about practice and keeping. Now it doesn't it doesn't come contrary to faith, and so when it says the law is not of faith, what it means is that this is, in, in the sense of justification, the law is about doing, not about believing. Okay? So the law is not of faith, given this application of the law. But, what does that lead to? Well, it leads to the curse, because no man can keep it, right? And so what's the thing that Jesus has delivered us from? Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Do you see? For it is written, everyone who is cursed is the one who hangs on a tree. Okay, and we know that Jesus is the one who hangs hang on a tree, right? So this is the point. And just like before it said that cursed are they who do not keep everything that's in, in, in the law, so here, Jesus redeems us from the curse because Christ was sent to be our substitute and die for us in our place. What was the purpose of that? That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ and that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So, do you see what's going on here? This, this whole development of his argument is very methodical and very particular. And you have to catch the nuances of the historical redemptive program as it unfolds, and then the particular applications that Paul makes for the individual believer. Okay? So, hypothetically, and this is why you find this language in Romans chapter 2 as well, that the one who keeps the law, the one who does the law is justified in his doing, right? But nobody ever does that. Nobody can even do that, right? But because the law is a reflection of who God is, we don't hate the law. We don't look at the law as something that's derogatory. We don't look at the law as being something that is hateful. We love the law. David rejoiced in the law. He knew what it was to be justified by faith. Psalm 32, this is picked up by Paul in Romans 4. So David knows what it means to not have his sins imputed to him, but he also says, I love thy law. These are not contraries when it comes to the life of an individual believer. But like I said, we have for so long been influenced by where we're not under the law, we're under grace, that for most believers in that school of thought, you know, they don't even read the Old Testament. They don't even know what the Bible says. And, you know, it's a shame. I remember one person when I was a pastor in Somerset, that he even asked me that. He said to me, well, we don't really need the Old Testament, do we? Because, you know, we're not under the law, but under grace. I said, no, that's not, that's not the conclusion that you must draw because of that statement in Paul. 
in that section in Romans 6, he's not getting at whether you read the Old Testament. It's a very different matter altogether. And to conclude that because we're not under the law, we don't need the Old Testament is, is a complete fabrication. You know, we need the entirety of Scripture. All Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable. Right? You can't have just bits and pieces of God's Word. You need it all. But anyway, so here, Christ becomes the one through whom the Spirit is given to those who are believers. And of course, as he said earlier, we're blessed as children of Abraham. So even the Gentiles, even the Gentiles, when they become believers, they become spiritual heirs of Abraham. Now that, that, is, a, that is a most profound thought. But it goes back to the very truth of what God said in Genesis when he said, In you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. There at the beginning of the founding of this nation, okay, that will be a chosen nation, back then, God included the Gentiles. Not only that, when we come into the New Testament and we find the full revelation of God, we find say, for example, in, first, uh, in 2 Timothy 1, that those who are in Christ have been graced before the foundation of the world. I mean, it's that remarkable. And that Christ was ordained to take on the sins of people from every tribe and every nation and every people. This is truly remarkable because this is God's plan as it unfolds. And so here, the blessing comes on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. But why is that the case? Well, because the promise was in Christ. Even though the Jews don't see that, that was the reality. And, you know, he goes on, he says, Brethren, I speak after the manner of man. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannul, or addeth thereto. You can't disannul this. You can't change it. You can't add to it. You can't alter it. And this is, he says later on, that you know God is one. And, of course, Christ is both God and man, right? And he's that one mediator. Um, the covenant that God made with Abraham is really a covenant that God makes with his son. That's the, that's the implication here. So that when he said that the promises were made to his seed, he said not and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. Here's the Christocentric focus of redemption from the very beginnings as Abraham had his experience of being singled out by God, being told that he, an Aramean, a wanderer, would be the seed, he would be the father of many nations, and the seed that would come from him would be the Christ. And he would be a blessing to all the families of the earth. So, Christ is the focus of the gospel. It's not about doing, it's not even about the believing in the gospel. Because even our faith comes to us through Christ. Christ is the gospel. It's not, you know, a lot of people think, oh, the gospel is if you believe in the Lord Jesus, you'll be saved. And of course that's true. But in the statement, if you believe in the Lord Jesus, you will be saved. The emphasis isn't upon belief. The emphasis is upon Christ. Do you see? So that when God works these miracles in our midst, He doesn't do it through our obedience or our doing or our achieving. He does it by His grace. And it's through the hearing of faith, He says. Because the hearing of faith comes through the Word of God message about Christ in some versions, even though mine will say the hearing of the word of 
God. The point being that the message of the Word of God is about the Christ, who is Savior, who is Lord. And you cannot have a gospel that is just about our response. That would be another form of works. Do you see? And that's the thing that most people today, they have forgotten. So all of God's parts, if you will, of the covenant, they all fit. They all go hand in glove. They all are necessary. And it is all about Christ and Christ alone. It is all about faith, but by grace. Faith in Christ by grace. You cannot have faith without being graced by God. And so here, Christ is the one through which this promise was given. And the concluding part to our section here is very simply, if the inheritance be of the law, that is no more a promise. But God gave it to him, verse 18, gave it to Abraham by promise. By promise. It goes back to the word. And if you take it back even further, it goes back to the promise that God made to Adam and Eve in the garden. And if you take it back even further, it goes back to the eternal counsel that God had with His Son in all eternity, saying, I will give you as a light to the Gentiles. I will give you as a means of the redemption of all people goes back to the Father loved the Son and has given Him everything. You know, this is the counsel, the eternal covenant of redemption that God alludes to through John 17. That the ones that you have given Him, those are the ones that you come and dies for. The Lord tells us that He is the Good Shepherd and the Good Shepherd gives His life sheep. You know, Christ is the one who shed his blood so that we can even say God bought the church with his blood. God doesn't have a body, right? God is a spirit and has not a body like man. John Shadishism. But God in Christ, in Christ, shed his blood. And so God buys the church redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Here it's in relation to the law and in relation to what the law does to those of us who try to live by the law. If we're trying to be justified by it, we will always end up cursed. If we misuse the law and try to use it as a means of approaching God and getting right with Him, we will always be cursed. But the, pro the promise that we will be His inheritance, the promise that we will be His people and He will be our God, is by God's grace in Christ. And so this text to us now becomes very rich in meaning both historically and in the individual application. Because we too, as Gentiles, are recipients of this blessing according to God's promise in Christ. Christ is all. Christ is all. And he must receive all the glory. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we can have the freedom to read this passage to reflect upon it here today. We thank you for your plan, your covenant, your promise. And we thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus, in whom all this is made and in whom it comes to pass. And by whom it is guaranteed for your people. What a joy we have knowing that you've included us in your eternal plan so that you can show your love to us and you can manifest the great grace upon us even when we were your enemies. We will never ever exhaust this
this wonderful deep teaching. We'll never plumb the depths, but we will certainly enjoy trying it. We thank you again through Christ our Lord. For his sake.